And I would like to introduce John Spindler, who will introduce our session for today. Thank you. Thank you, Julianne. Well, good morning and welcome to the third in a series of six classes titled Horse Country. Last week, we learned so much about horse breeds and the many disciplines that adults participate in with horses that we ran over 22 minutes and still had more questions and comments to field. I guess that's a good problem. Today, we will learn about how horses fit into our environment, the diets of a horse and forages, best management practices, and how horse owners and managers are being tasked to preserve our water resources. Back with us again are our three equine team experts, Dr. Cynthia Sanders, Dr. Carissa Wickens, and Caitlin Bainham. Please join me in welcoming them to today's class. Thank you, John. Um, once again, I'll start off our presentation today and I will share my screen. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, best management practices when it relates to horses um, and forages. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what best management practices are, because we're going to talk today a little bit about how horses affect our environment here in Florida, um, how we as producers in the equine industry try to help to protect our environment, um, when we look at nutrient load and water. So I'm going to relate that to forages and what horses eat here in Florida um, on a daily basis. So with that, when we look at best management practices and we call them BMPs. So if I refer to them as BMPs, you know, we're talking about the best management practices. These are practices regulated by the Florida Department of Agriculture. And we not only have them in the horse industry, we have them in all phases of agriculture, whether it's row crops, cow calf, um, nursery growers, they all have these best management practices. They're regulated by the Florida Department of Agriculture, but the research is based from UFIFAS, from our research work, and um, also from the water management districts, as well as FDACs. So like I said, BMPs are for all agricultural crops and livestock, and they're developed to protect the environment. So when we're looking at forages, we manage our forages based on these best management practices. And when we look at best management practices, they're practical measure, measures that these horse producers or any agricultural producer takes to reduce the amount of fertilizer, animal waste, um, and other pollutants um, that to enter our water resources. And Carissa and um, Caitlin, I think are gonna talk more about the animal waste in a minute, but I'm gonna focus on forages and what, what horses eat. Um, this relates to nutrient management, irrigation management, and water resource protection. And forages is gonna fall mainly under nutrient management. Um, we don't have a lot of um, people that have horses or cattle that, that use a lot of irrigation that falls into row crops and vegetable production. So when we look at forage management, an important thing that we um, consider when we're recommending to our producers is the forage selection. So it's kind of like, the Florida friendly um, uh, slogan, right plant, right place. Um, and we look at that in forage selection for pastures too. We're in Florida. And from those of you from different states know that we are very sandy here. Um, our soil type is not as great as perhaps the, up the Eastern coast or Kentucky, and we can't grow the forages that they grow there. So, um, first of all, when we look at perennials, perennials are, of course, our plants that return year after year. Our example of that for forages would be Bahia grass or Bermuda grass, and I'll give you some examples of those in a minute. Annuals are those that life cycle within one year, and these are forages that we can plant annually, either winter annuals like rye or oats, or we can plant summer annuals like a millet um, or there's some other annuals that um, even in the summer, like Alice Clover, that also are legumes. So that's nitrogen fixing. So when we look at this forage se selection, we also need to look at several factors um, about the area. Number one, the site that's being considered for the forage. 
again, we are very sandy type soils. Uh, that, uh, that's why bahia grass does well here in Florida. There's some clovers that are nice and they're legumes and nitrogen fixing, but if we don't have a heavier type soil, we usually don't recommend those. So the other thing we need to look at is stocking rate. And with horse owners, we see this um, a lot where they put too many horses on the land in the pasture. And then Caitlin and I get calls and wanna know why they don't have any grass. Um, because perhaps they might have four, four horses on one acre. And our recommendation is at least two acres of improved pasture per horse. So stocking rate is an issue um, that we try to recommend um, the correct stocking rate so we can keep that forage lush and, lush and green throughout the spring and summer. Of course, forage varieties, which I talked about, we don't want to put a legume in a real sandy type soil because they need to have a heavier type soil. Here in Alachua County, we do have some of those heavier type soils on the north end of the county, up around Alachua and La Crosse, as well as on the south end of the county down around Micanopy, which sometimes those legume varieties work well there. Um, the, the other consideration we need to look at is grazing management and that makes sure we're following the best management practices when we're looking at forages. So basically our warm season perennial grass that does very well here is bahia grass. Bermuda grass is another one that's used mostly for hay production. Um, but Bermuda grass is the one you see with like the V seed head, like this picture is. Um, that's the one that's the most prevalent for most of our equine operations um, or pastures. And this is a lush bahia grass field. Bahia grass is usually lush about June and July. Um, it is a perennial, it comes back every year. Bahia grass, if managed correctly, those roots can go down in the soil about six to seven feet. If that soil is aerated and managed and fertilized and um, managed properly for grazing. So grazing management also plays into this and that is also related to the stocking rate. So we certainly don't want to overgraze it. So this is a lush pasture taken right here in, in Alachua County. This is a pasture that's overgrazed taken right here in Alachua County. <laughs> and I see on horse, uh, probably horse owners, I see a lot more of this than I see of the lush um, because horses graze 24 seven. And um, one of our recommendations is not to graze this grass less than three to four inches. And as you can see, this grass is very um, short. And so when we get short like this, we stress that plant. Um, a lot of times you'll see that horses will pull it up right by the roots and the roots will be right there on top of the ground. And usually that's an issue with compaction because if managed, like I said, roots on bahia grass can go down six to seven feet but it's gotta be aerated. It's kind of like a flower pot. Your flower pots get compacted, the plant starts to grow and roots get compacted. We need to aerate that, put it in a bigger pot. Well, with pastures, we would come in and either um, use a tiller or a, or a disc across it or a um, pasture renovator um, to break that soil up so we get some renovation. So sometimes I go out to take soil samples with a probe and you can't even probe down the four inches that we need for a soil sample because the grass is so compact. And when this happens, you'll start seeing bahia grass die and the quantity decreasing. So again, our most popular is bahia grass. Our most popular variety would be Pensacola. And there's several, several different varieties of bahia grass, um, but Pensacola is our most, most popular and why? because it tolerates a wide pH. And so when we go out and take soil samples, which is a part of the best management practices, we'll also test for soil pH. pH should be somewhere between five and six and a half for bahia grass. It tolerates a wider pH. I've seen bahia grass in pastures with pH as high as eight, eight and a half. So it does tolerate a, a wide um, pH range. It produces well in low fertility soils. We're proof of that in Florida because our soils are very low in fertility and very sandy. And it's pretty easy to establish. We establish it by seed and we establish it. Planting dates for that is somewhere between March 15th and September. Um, the other thing is very drought tolerant. 
And it's also very tolerant to overgrazing. So withstands close grazing. So it's hard to kill. Um, and it's um, a plant that is, is um, probably one of our best forages as far as nutrition on this plant. Um, on bahia grass, when in those lush months of June and July, we probably can see bahia grass up around 10%, maybe 12% if fertilized, but about 10% when it's lush. Um, then it starts to go down, that's in protein, and then that protein starts to decrease about late August when this plant starts to start going dormant in the fall and winter. So right now this plant's not lush and green. It's probably what you'll see in a lot of yards or pastures right now. Um, and it's brown since we've had the frost lately, but it's not dead. It will turn around and come back as soon as we start getting nights above 60 degrees. Um, that that has, grass starts greening up and, and growing about March 15th or so. So just the planting dates, Tifton 9 is another variety of bahia grass. You really can't tell them apart when you see them in the pasture, um, but planting dates are anytime between February 15th, March 15th through about August. We seed that with seeds. There are other forages that we don't use seeds. We use the actual plant material, but this one is a seed and we plant somewhere between 15 and 40 pounds per acre at a depth of about a quarter to a half inch on bahia grass. So I talked about stocking rate and stocking rate is going to depend on several things. And you can see that we do have some sprigs of bahia grass in there, but it's very few and far between. Um, the amount of pasture depends on the size and the age of the horse. Um, it also varies throughout the year, which I said dormant, the bahia grass will go dormant in the fall and winter. So we're going to have to supplement with either another forage, planting an annual rye or rye grass over that bahia grass, um, or we're, of course, we're gonna supplement them with a, a feed, a nutritional source during the winter and fall as well. And again, we recommend two to two and a half acres of pasture per horse. And I think I already mentioned, do not graze less than three to four inches. So um, pasture management, we're gonna, for best management practices, we're gonna take soil samples every two to three years to determine our deficiencies um, in, in uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. In Florida, we assume all soils are low in nitrogen because we are sandy type soils. So um, we recommend our average recommendation on nitrogen is at least 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, is our IFAS recommendation for fertilization. And then the other um, nutrients, of course, we're gonna test with soil samples and that'll tell us how much phosphorus or how much potassium we need per acre as well as our minor nutrients. Um, we base those on IFAS recommendations and research and that's what we recommend to our producers. We don't want them to put out too much fertilizer, whether it's nitrogen, potassium or phosphorus. Um, because number one, it's expensive right now. Um, it's always been expensive fertilizer. But again, we, we're looking at the environmental effects on, the, on that fertilizer and water runoff. So we want to follow IFAS recommendations. Um, we also want to have a clean, weed-free uh, bed when we start to plant. And this is a big one because a lot of people, when they renovate their pastures in the spring, they don't have anywhere to move their horses. And the horses really need to be off of that pasture at least 90 days to 120 days for that pasture to get established. So just looking at the nutrient management, kind of a review, we, want, we use soil tests and tissue tests to determine pH and the nutrient analysis. And we recommend fertilizer based on IFAS recommendations here from our soils lab. Um, we make sure we choose appropriate sources and formulations of fertilizer based on their nutritional needs. Um, I can just say that, you know, if a pasture is lush and may not need fertilizer, then there's no need to put that fertilizer out. Again, we would look at the soil sample to know where we are on those recommendations. Also, we make sure our producers are calibrating adjusting fertilizer application equipment. So they're putting out exactly the amount they need per acre and not over um, fertilizing. And then the other thing on the, on the BMPs is these producers have to keep extensive records 
on nutrient application. So that's when they fertilize, what pastures they fertilized. Um, they have to keep all the soil samples so that they have those recommendations and that they followed those recommendations when they fertilized. So with that, that's some bahia grass. Um, I'm gonna turn the over, I think, to Carissa. I think, um, thanks, Cindy. Caitlin's gonna, Caitlin's gonna get us started okay. and then I will take over from there. Okay, We're Caitlin, gonna... it's all yours. All righty, let me share my screen here and I'm gonna leave my um, video off to try to play nice with the internet um, gods this morning. So I'll get us started and um, kind of go a little bit more in depth on some of the stuff that Cindy just mentioned, and then Carissa will take it from there and, and go even a, a step further into some uh, more specific practices that we see on horse farms following um, those best management practices. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about what we do um, outside of the pasture consultation that Cindy mentioned in extension to try to improve water quality in our environment by promoting these BMPs on horse farms. That's the big idea. So the background here um, is no secret that Florida is very popular. I think we have uh, over a thousand people a day that are moving here each day. Um, and those are ag and non-ag related folks. Um, so water is obviously an increasingly scarce resource. Um, a, a, some years back, there was a figure that said we were going to need 20% more water by 2030. And 2030 is not all that far away. And that's clean, drinkable, usable water. So um, th that's the big why. Everybody needs water. And a lot of people, you know, you turn on your faucets, you have water. And unless you're more connected to these facts, you don't really think much beyond that. All is well in your world. But um, when you really start looking into what our needs are going to be, um, it gets a little bit scary. And there's a lot of finger pointing when it comes to trying to figure out who's ruining it for everyone else. Is it, um, you know, the urban population, these homeowners, septic tanks? Is it agriculture? Um, is it factories? I mean, there's a, and, and, and the answer is it's everybody. We all are playing a part in, um, you know, supplying these nutrients to our water sources that then become pollutants. And we all have a part in making it better. So we, as the equine industry, must also do our part. And that's where these BMPs um, evolved from, was a way to allow um, our agriculturalists and our equine farm owners something to hold on to, to say, hey, I'm doing my part because I'm following these science-based practices that are proven to make water quality better. So this is a state mandated program, as Cindy mentioned, through our Florida Department of Agriculture. And it was developed you know, through research with IFAS, but also there's a lot of stakeholders um, at the table. And I think I have a slide next kind of explaining who else kind of had a seat at this table. And now if your property is within one of these action areas um, around these sensitive water bodies, which they're, they're, they're well beyond just if you, you don't have to live on a river or on a lake, you can live actually far beyond those actual waterways and be considered in these, um, sensitive areas. And this is no longer voluntary. It's actually mandatory that these farms are enrolled um, or they could be um, held responsible if, if the Department of Environmental Protection you know, wanted to, they could fine them for not being enrolled. And it's a slow process, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of farm owners um, that aren't too quick to jump on board with this government regulated program. But it's really, it's a good program and it comes from a place of science. So us and Extension, it's, it's not our program, but we do our part to push the good science that is BMPs. And so, you know, we have a lot of these relationships with these farm owners. So we try to build that trust. And although we don't oversee and we as the university have zero regulatory capacity, uh, we are only the educational arm we try to build that trust for the program because you know, we do believe in the science of these practices. So we are the education and the outreach arm. Um, and with our, our equine folks, you know, we found that you know, they like to learn from other horse owners. So Carissa will mention uh, more about some of the you know, on-farm uh, experiments and research that, that we've done. And, and a big part of that is to have field days and let 
horse owners learn from other horse owners and they say, oh, yeah, my neighbor's doing that, you know, and it's working really well for them. It's, you know, saving them money, saving them time, whatever the case may be. I think I'll also adopt that. So um, it's been a really good tool for us to have horse owners learn from other horse owners. So just so you're a little bit more familiar, this is kind of death by acronym um, in a lot of what we do. There's a lot of acronyms. So I've tried to break it down, but it is a regulated program. And these are all the various entities that have a part in creating these best management practices. And as Cindy mentioned, not just for the horse community, but for every commodity group, they have their own set of practices that are specific to that commodity group. So you have um, the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Agriculture, the various water management districts. These are just the two that are in Marion County, but all of them are involved, UF IFAS, and of course, local county government has a big role. You know, they, they are also very involved in anything that is taking place within their county. And then citizens, you know, we have a lot of ranchers um, and agriculturalists that were asked for input um, because they're the ones ultimately that are going to know if these practices are going to be feasible or not. So in extension, some of the things that we do um, in Marion County, I have a best management practices educational program. Um, and the primary targets are manure management and pasture management. So pasture management, Cindy talked on, and, and that's a big one, right? That affects every horse owner. Um, and, and that's something that folks generally really want help with. So it's one of those topics that um, gets them in the door, so to speak. They want to know how to grow their grass and how to maintain that grass. So that's a really good tool for us. Um, and then manure management, Carissa's going to focus on here in a minute. Um, but, you know, that's an issue that when you acquire horses, you don't necessarily think of, I'm going to have to manage the manure that comes out of this horse. And horses are like potato chips, so we need more than one. And with every horse, there's more and more manure. And what are we doing with this manure that could be a source of pollution? So these are kind of the two big um, components of best management practices when it comes to horse farms. Um, and then those those educational targets, of course, are identified as the areas that are going to contribute most of that nitrogen, which is our nutrient of concern in this area, runoff into our waterways that are then going to impair those waterways. Um, so, you know, you get nitrogen from manure and, of course, um, from poor pasture management. And so um, this program kind of allows us to tie a lot of these pieces together and have greater impacts than just kind of focusing on um, one of those um, practices. So our objectives um, in extension, and this goes for not just me, but I'm sure Cindy and other folks that are teaching these practices. First of all, we really need to raise the awareness of the science that are BMPs. You know, we didn't just come up with a booklet of things for farm owners to do because we thought it sounded nice. Um, there's actual science that backs this up. And then we want to familiarize these farm owners with the partners that are vested in this program. We don't want them to think it's just a university run program because it's certainly not. You know, who are all of those stakeholders and who are their local stakeholders? And, you know, maybe we don't need to be scared of DEP. We don't need to be scared of the water management district. Some of them have really helpful um, cost share programs and other opportunities to help these farms work through these BMPs on their farm. So we kind of try to make those connections for folks. And then of course, we, we encourage ultimately the practice change in the areas of manure and pasture management. And we wanna increase the number of farms, the, the acreage enrolled in our state BMP program. So these are the, the big objectives and it kind of resembles this tiered cake that I have here. Um, the top of the cake is ultimately getting acres enrolled but the bottom and the largest layer of that cake is just raising the awareness of the good science that went into these BMPs. So um, we've done a lot of various activities through grant funding um, and other special projects. Um, these have happened in Marion County. I've worked with Dr. Wickens on these. So we've done some on-farm manure management research. We partnered with um, the Water Management District in Marion County. They funded this research. So again, bringing um, all of these folks together to demonstrate we're all, we all have a similar goal. And then we kind of created uh, some BMP demonstration sites. 
through this research. So this research was looking at composting manure and the effectiveness um, on water quality. And so we were able to actually pull some data to characterize is composting, composting your manure actually an effective way or are we just saying that? And it actually is an effective way to minimize um, nutrient runoff and leaching in our, in our waterways. So then through this research, we invited people out to the farm to see these compost systems, talk to the farm owners um, that we were working with to get their take. Again, that peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and then beyond that project, we've done other composting demonstration sites that we've built in areas that are now we use for field trips. Or if I'm working with a client that says, man, I really would like to develop my own compost system, I can take them around the county to a few of these sites and show them some different design ideas, um, different management strategies. Again, talk to these farm owners, get their take on how they manage it and, and what it means in regards to money and time every week to kind of encourage these new farm owners that, yeah, this is something I'm interested in. Um, of course, we do a lot of pasture management seminars and field demonstrations and farm tours that are gonna highlight compliant operations. So there's a lot of people in our industry that are doing a really, really good job. And, you know, we don't do a good enough job promoting them and showing everybody else that agriculture is doing, doing their part or trying to do their part. So um, there's an ag awareness aspect to BMPs and encouraging our urban residents to go on these farm tours to see that we have a lot of horse farms and cattle farms that are really trying to be environmentally savvy and do their part. Um, and of course, in recent years, we've done a lot more virtual education and created some creative works through publications and articles and videos. And um, this has been great to reach people outside of just the county that I work in and really outside of our state of Florida to bring awareness to other areas that, you know, wow, look at what Florida horse farms are doing and promoting that in, a, in their areas. So it's been a lot of fun. And this is probably the most impactful part of what we do in Extension is, is the hands-on bringing people to the farm. Um, so um, this is just some more examples of some of our compost demonstration sites. Um, a lot of this, you know, we get grant funds through the Department of Agriculture. Again, they want to see their program pushed forward. And so we kind of are the boots on the ground to help them um, in local communities and get these projects out there and have these field days. So these on-farm demonstrations are a primary teaching tool for us in extension. Um, these are just a few flyers of some of the things that we've done in Central Florida. We have pasture management schools, um, again, that are really focused on that forage aspects. We hone in on people that just have a few acres, realizing a lot of our horse farms, they don't have even 10, 20, 30 acres, they might have two or five acres. And so how can we help those guys best manage their small acreage properties? So we have a program designed just for the few acre properties. Um, and then, I mean, this is just a few, the tip of the iceberg here, but we do all sorts of stuff. And then what's not mentioned here, what Cindy and I do probably the most is those one-on-one -on -one consultations. So, you know, these programs are great for reaching a, a group of folks, but Sometimes we make a bigger impact for that person that discovers our office and gets our number and they call us and we can actually go out to their farm and look at their specific situation and tailor a management plan, whether it be for manure or for pasture, that's going to work for them. So um, that's pretty special. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wins and let her focus in a little bit on the specifics of managing manure. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. So next slide, please. All right, so um, I like to begin just introducing to, to this pretty big problem that we have with, um, as Caitlin mentioned, just with the number of horses that we have here in the state of Florida, and even sometimes on each individual operation, having multiple horses means that manure happens. So that's kind of the polite way of saying it. Um, but when we talk about horse waste, you know, waste output from these animals, we're talking about the feces, the urine, and a lot of these animals, particularly if they're kept for any period of time during the day in stalls, we also then have bedding material. So whether that's, you know, wood-based bedding products like wood shavings or pelleted wood bedding, you know, spent hay or straw, 
you know, certainly we, we are amassing some additional waste when we clean those stalls and we're pulling out or stripping that bedding material with the urine and the feces. So when we work with our horse clientele, um, it's really important to discuss with them the importance of manure management strategies. Um, you know, again, they care about and, and really enjoy working with the horses, but we are generating this pretty, pretty profuse amount of waste each day and each year. So that requires responsible action. So a lot of our education, a lot of our research focuses on manure storage strategies, the disposition or you know, removal of that manure from the farm, or in some cases, if they have enough acreage, as Cindy mentioned, you know, we have very sandy soils here in Florida. We can add some good organic material back into the soil if we land apply some of this, this animal waste, especially when we put it out maybe as a finished compost medium. Um, so getting some of that organic material incorporated over time into our soils, it can increase the water holding capacity of our very sandy soils and add back some, some nutrients as well. So um, this is just kind of an idea, you know, this is just showing even three muck buckets. This may be just one stall will fill one, one large muck bucket. And so again, if you have three horses, you're filling three muck buckets a day. And I'll give you guys a little bit more facts and figures on what this actually looks like on a yearly basis per horse. So next slide, Caitlin. All right, so um, you guys will probably hear us, um, you know, out there in the industry as we're talking to folks. We really equate this to what we call mount manure. Um, just to give you some idea, one light breed horse, so some of those horse breeds that we were talking about, like a quarter horse, an Arabian, Tennessee walking horse, roughly these horses maybe weigh somewhere around 1,000 to 1,100 pounds. One of these 1,000 pound horses will poop maybe four up to 13 times a day. And in a day, they will produce a total of around 50 pounds of manure per day. If we, if we take that a step further, this individual animal is producing a little over nine tons of manure per year. And one ton of that manure does contain some nutrients. It contains roughly 11 pounds of nitrogen, two pounds of uh, phosphorus and eight pounds of, per, uh, eight pounds of potassium per ton. Oh. Sorry about that, forgot That's I was right. too <laughs> It's okay. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so if we if we take this again further, what we're talking about here is on an annual basis, one horse is producing 2.4 cubic feet per day in manure and bedding material, which is 876 cubic feet per year or roughly 32 cubic yards. So especially if we have a facility or a property where we have multiple horses, it doesn't take long to look something like, you know, if we're just amassing piles of, of stall waste, we can get this mount manure that's pictured in that right bottom photo. Um, it doesn't take long, unfortunately, to get that, that generating that much of waste on a facility. And so what do we do about that? Um, so you all remember um, from our very first week together on January 13th, um, if you can hit the arrow, Caitlin, please. So Florida has how many horses? You guys probably remember it was close to 400,000 horses. So if we're producing 9.1 ton, tons of manure per horse per year, so on that annual basis, we multiply that by almost 400,000 horses in our state, we're talking about millions of tons of manure. It, it's just, it is crazy. And so that is a very important part of our industry that we struggle with and need to figure out how to manage better. All right, next slide. So one of the strategies that we do spend um, quite a bit of time researching, doing some on-farm on applied uh, research studies, as well as some educational programs, um, focusing on some of these different manure management strategies, particularly as Caitlin mentioned, some of those smaller acreage facilities, um, because a lot of these folks may not have the financial means to pay a company to haul their manure off. And they also may not have enough acreage, they don't have enough land with good pasture on that, that property to effectively utilize the, the waste stream to a land apply it. They just don't have the acreage or the space to do that properly. So one of the options we do talk about is composting of manure. And so why would we think about this strategy as being a, a positive management tool? Well, it can have many benefits. Um, so if we compost this waste stream, we take this bedding, the manure and the urine, 
and we compost it, we get production of a much more homogeneous material that can actually have some value and some benefit. The material in itself is much easier to spread and manage. So even if they are then going to land apply it or have it hauled away or further dispose of it in some other means, it can make this material a little bit easier to, to deal with. And then in some cases, our compost can even have some marketability. Like I said, it, it can be a good soil amendment to get some good organic material back into our sandy soils here in Florida. It can serve as a growth media um, for things like earthworms. It can be used as a mulch, and it can also be considered or utilized somewhat as sort of a, a more time released or slow type of release fertilizer. So if we compost and we get this nice finished product, in theory, what we want to get is this very rich soil appearance, soil-like hummusy material. The best benefit for horse owners in terms of composting manure is that we can get some really significant volume reduction. So we've seen in some of the research that's been conducted, we can get anywhere from 25 to 50% reduction of volume in terms of the amount of waste that we have to manage. We also, when we compost effectively, we are heating those piles or those windrows of material. And if we heat those appropriately, we're getting somewhere between maybe 130 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit at the center of those piles when we manage manure or stall waste in this fashion. When we do that, we can have destruction of pathogens such as bacteria, but we can also reduce um, the chance of having weed seeds and parasites in that manure. So ultimately, it can also be a good pasture management strategy rather than just spreading raw stall waste, raw manure on the field. If we compost it, we're not reestablishing or letting those weed seeds get out there in our pasture. So some destruction of those are, are very important. And also for horse health, um, we're not reshedding re or redistributing re parasites out there if we are gonna put this on our pasture. So just a couple of things to give you guys an idea of what's involved with this, sort of at the level of the amount of waste we're talking and, and what are some of the, the tools and strategies that we utilize to effectively compost horse manure on site on farms. Um, there's several things that the BMP manuals that we work from that DEP, FDAX, and UF IFAS have developed together in partnership. We have certain guidelines for even at the level of where these manure storage areas or compost system areas should be located on site on a farm. So some of the guidelines for this is obviously finding a fairly um, flat site away from low lying areas where water collects on the property. We also don't really wanna set these manure storage or disposal areas on top of like the high spot or the, the hill on the property, because anytime we have a rain event that can then you know, penetrate that material and cause some of that runoff that will then run down the hill into other areas of the property. So looking for that fairly um, flat site or location on, on the farm. We have some rules of thumb in terms of how far away that manure storage area or compost site should be from potable wells. Also from open water courses, um, you know, lakes, streams, ponds, um, those kind of water sources on the property, as well as sinkholes. Um, and in the past, we have seen, unfortunately, some of our equine facilities, you know, they've actually amassed a, a large amount of their stall waste and just deposited it in a sinkhole. And of course, that is then creating you know, the potential for leaching of nitrogen and phosphorus down into the Floridian aquifer, um, into our spring sheds. So we really, really want to avoid that. And we're trying to educate horse owners that that certainly is, is not the best place to be de depositing manure. Um, so away from those sinkholes, at least 200 feet away from those water courses and sinkholes, at least at a minimum, 100 feet away from their private potable well, and certainly we want good neighbor relations. Um, we have a lot of equine communities that really are more of like an equestrian neighborhood that are in close proximity with non-horse owning folks or in these semi-urban or urbanized areas. So neighbor relations are really a, a key part of BMPs as well. Um, so making sure that the manure piles are out of view as best as possible and downwind from the neighbors so that odors and, and other unattractive aspects of manure management aren't necessarily right front and center in front of a, a neighbor. So in terms of how we compost and some of the guidance that we give our equine clientele, 
managing the pile is very important. And as much as there is some science here, there's also a lot of practice. Um, there's a lot of troubleshooting involved. And so it, it's a little bit of an art as well. Um, they have to amass a minimum pile size of roughly one cubic yard. That means that we're going to be able to heat that, that manure effectively to get destruction of those weed seeds, the pathogens, make sure that we're speeding up this, this really nice natural decomposition process. So one cubic yard, um, you guys can imagine basically this is like the size of, of a typical washer or dryer. So a pile at least that big is needed to get the composting process effectively started. The temperature that I mentioned is very critical. Um, maintaining these piles at around 130 to 150, maybe almost up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And ideally we're keeping that pile at that temperature for about 21 days in order to, to effectively destroy those pathogens, weed seeds and parasites. Um, so they can use those long stem thermometers, compost thermometers to manage that process and to see how they're doing with temperature. They can also turn or aerate these piles. We need some oxygen in this process for those microbes and bacteria to help break down um, that, that manure and that stall waste. So turning by hand, or obviously, you know, some of our folks have some small equipment on farm. They have a, a small tractor with a front end loader or a bucket, um, or maybe even like a little skid steer. So that those are great pieces of equipment for people to do this a little easier. Um, the nice thing too, we've got some systems now where, especially for folks that just don't have a lot of time or don't have that, that small farm equipment, you don't have to necessarily get in there and aerate and turn manually or by hand. You can actually do what we call static composting and you can inject oxygen into those piles or those manure windrows in other ways. Um, so sometimes just um, actually placing horizontal PVC pipe or dryer hose that have incremental holes punched in them it will help kind of draw in some air and oxygen into the pile. They can also, um, there's actually sort of this O2 composter system out there. And <clears throat> some people do a variety of adaptations to this system, but essentially you, you purchase an air pump. And again, you place these pipes in, in layers in your compost or in your compost bin. And then it actually automatically on a timer, you can inject air into it. So you don't have to get in there with a pitchfork or a shovel and turn it yourself. So it can be a, a good, good labor um, and, and back, back wrenching activity saver if you don't have to do that manually. Um, we certainly want a good level of moisture in this material. We don't want material that's overly wet and saturated, but we don't want it too dry either. So adding water and checking moisture levels is, is a pretty good idea as well. And then we can amend these piles with nitrogen if we need to. Sometimes we can just add you know, straight raw manure that we pick out of the horse's paddocks. Um, other times we can add a little bit of like a commercial fertilizer just to get some like an inoculant of more nitrogen into the pile. But the, the really what we're trying to go here, uh, go for here is this ideal C to N or what we call the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So horse manure automatically just as it comes out of the horse is pretty darn close to the ideal C to N ratio of about 25 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Um, I'll show you guys in just a, a minute in the next slide, you know, we actually have looked at the nutrient composition and we can look at and analyze the C to N ratio in different horse waste products, depending on what type of bedding is used. Um, so we can kind of see how we maybe either get right on target with that, that ideal C to N ratio or how we can, you know, vary or, or maybe deter from that. And sometimes that can be a problem for effective composting. So thanks, Caitlin. Next slide, please. So this is actually some work, um, one of our other equine colleagues in the department, Dr. Lori Warren, um, this was one of her master's students, so a graduate student that was looking at the composition of stall waste produced by horses on a couple different operations here in Florida. Um, I believe they did look at like a show performance horse barn, a racetrack, and then a third facility that was a little bit more just kind of recreational pleasure horse um, ownership and, and activities. Um, but this was comparing that nutrient composition of these different uh, stall waste materials. You guys can see here that there's the percent nitrogen, the percent carbon, and then from there we can certainly get that C to N ratio. So if you look here, if we are housing horses in stalls that are bedded with spent maybe bahia grass hay as the bedding material and straw, we actually are getting very close to that ideal C to N ratio, 33 parts carbon to one part nitrogen a little higher when straw bedding is used. But if we compare that with wood shavings, when we're using a wood-based bedding material, now we've gone way above on our carbon. There's a lot of carbon material in that wood-based bedding. 
So that can take a lot longer to break down. So sometimes this is a medium where we may need to supplement and add some nitrogen back into the compost. Or we can also do a little bit better job maybe when we clean those stalls, we try to minimize how much bedding we strip out with the manure. But it just shows you kind of an idea of there, there is some management and a little bit of art involved as well as the science. So Caitlin um, did show a, a couple of examples. Um, she mentioned that you know, we've had an opportunity to do some of these applied on-farm research trials. We set up educational demonstration sites. Um, so these are some nice examples of some compost bin systems um, based on just some, some really simple management that some of our smaller acreage folks wanted to do. So some of these photos do come from, they're, they're all from North Central Florida. Um, some of these are from farms or little farmettes or ranchettes in Ocala. Um, some are actually from, from folks that maybe have two, three, four horses in some of those equestrian neighborhoods or equestrian communities. So they can get quite fancy and involve a little bit more cost and labor and really more thought into the design. Um, but most of these, we encourage them to locate it near the barn so it's convenient as they're cleaning stalls and removing that waste material, that it's very convenient to, to the location of where they want their bins. But again, to follow BMPs, we want to make sure that this area is abiding by those setbacks as it relates to water bodies on the property and the wells and, and those, those sites on the farm. Um, so this is actually, this is poured concrete and, you know, purchased lumber that they've used to create a two bin composting system. We encourage folks to keep the material covered, especially during heavy rain events. Um, again, that's just gonna pre prevent those piles from becoming saturated, which will add to the, the risk of having leachate beneath those piles. If we can pour concrete or put hard packed clay underneath these, these manure storage areas, we're gonna mitigate that nitrogen and phosphorus leaching into the, the groundwaters beneath. So that can be very beneficial, but sometimes that is not overly cost effective for our small scale folks. So covering it actually can be very helpful and becomes a very important BMP as it relates to manure management. This is another example. This is a small three bin system. The bins allow the folks to actually start assembling the raw stall waste into the first bin. And then after that sets for a period and fills to the volume that they need to get effective heating, they can turn that and aerate that and move it to the second bin where then they can continue actively composting that while they assemble more you know, raw material. And then eventually they can take this, this second bin, the material here, they can rotate it into the third bin. And you guys see this third bin has a very nice rich soil-like hummusy material. So this would be the finished compost after maybe three to, to five months. This is now good compost that's ready to land apply. But in the meantime, they can utilize these other two bins to actively compost other material. This is just some other examples. Um, these are some really nice examples of very inexpensive ways for some of our smaller uh, scale equine properties to, to try their hand at composting. These um, are assembled essentially from old fence boards or rails that they have laying around the farm and some lattice work. Um, the lattice work is really nice because again, now it's got these perforated sides to the bin system so that we're allowing some, some oxygen and airflow through those piles. We're allowing some air to come into the system. But this is a great example, the picture on the right, just using post and lattice work and some boards on the bottom to you know, maintain and kind of contain this material. But now they've got that three bin system in play. And then again, this is a beautiful picture, you guys, of the very raw, freshly cleaned stall waste that just came out of the stalls in the first bin, the active composting material that they're aerating and monitoring temperatures in the second bin, and then that nice finished compost in that third bin. So utilizing that three bin system to help manage the process and keep the material contained. This is one of those adapted O2 compost systems. Um, this was an older couple in, in Marion County that on their site, um, their small acreage property, they owned two horses. They actually had a four bin system, but you guys can see the PVC pipes that is fastened where it basically connects and inserts into the bins. And then they use a, an air pump. They can actually inject air into the system. So once they, they put their material from the stalls in these bins, they don't have to turn it. They don't have to manually aerate it. They're doing like a static composting with the injected air to help those bacteria, those microbes break down that material. 
Uh, but this is a system that has worked very nice for them. And then that finished material, they do land apply it on some of their paddocks. So just kind of to summarize here, when we focus in on manure management as a significant challenge for our equine properties, it's really important to, to teach these folks that a, a very important aspect of horse management is considering what you're doing with your manure. How and where is it being stored? What are you gonna do to dispose of it properly? Um, can you effectively compost and maybe utilize it on your farm or give it away to neighbors and so forth? Um, composting, as we know, is a natural decomposition process, but we're expediting it. We can accelerate it when we manage that process well. So ultimately the goal is to recycle that organic material. When we do this, because we're heating those piles, we reduce parasites. We don't have the fly problems associated with just leaving piles of raw manure out on a property. We get decreased odor from that material when we compost effectively. It really doesn't smell. It has more of an earthy smell to it. And then certainly, as I mentioned, we reduce the overall volume that then needs to be handled, stored, disposed of. So we're reducing that, that waste stream. And then, like I said, it can be used um, as a benefit, as a soil amendment, adding value to that manure or stall waste. We try to not have it be complicated. Um, when we teach horse owners about these, these management strategies, we want to try to help them customize their composting or manure storage or disposal system to what fits their specific farm. Um, what are their goals? What's their time and labor constraints? Um, you know, we, we try to help them work through those challenges and, and come up with a, a, a management strategy or plan that will be most effective for them. We monitor the piles or windrows. We make adjustments to improve that composting process. So again, that's a little bit where the practice and the art and the troubleshooting comes in. And we have many, many resources, both in print and through these workshops and programs that we do to help guide equine clientele on good BMPs as it relates to manure handling and management. So um, Caitlin, actually, if you can skip two more slides. I just wanted to, to take a minute. So that was really focused on the manure management aspect. Um, but we have some other on-farm applied projects. We've been very interested as it relates back to forage management and grazing best management practices. We've been looking at incorporating um, legume forages. Cindy had mentioned clovers. Um, we've been focusing on perennial peanut. It is a summer perennial, um, it's, it's a warm season legume. It's a, a beautiful plant that has a little yellow flower. You can kind of see that in a couple of these pictures here, um, particularly that the larger photo on the right. But if we incorporate that into horse pastures, we can increase the, the nutritive quality of the pasture for the horses that are consuming it. But we're also using that, that legume to help fix nitrogen into the pasture system. Then what that allows us to do is rely less heavily on off-farm nitrogen inputs. So we don't have to put as much commercial nitrogen, commercial fertilizer out there. We can utilize that legume to our advantage. Um, so from a water protection standpoint, you know, we're relying less on those off-farm nitrogen inputs. We also can keep better vegetative cover in the soil and, and in those pastures so that we don't have erosion and runoff of nutrients. Um, so those are some pro projects that we're doing. Um, Caitlin and I and a couple of our other county agents actually have some demonstrations that we're gonna establish this perennial peanut into existing grass pastures on a few farms. And then, you know, we have pasture walks. We're bringing folks out to actually see this in practice and to ask questions about how we're getting it established, how we're managing it. Um, so I just wanted to show um, real quick, Caitlin, I think if you, let's see, we can try. If you click on the, the chestnut horse, the picture on the left, We'll see if that will play. It might be a little buffered, um, but this is one of our UF teaching and research horses in a perennial peanut, Bahia grass mixed pasture, and he is happily eating the perennial peanut there. Um, but you guys can see the leaf structure on that and the little yellow flower. Um, but that is one of our perennial warm season legumes that we can incorporate into a pasture system to help with nutrient management and also have some benefit for the horses. Um, during some of these projects, we do take horse measurements. So we're looking at body condition of the horses. Um, we're doing an ultrasound imaging here to look at fat, fat depth in the hind end of the horse to see if there's body composition changes related to consuming the different forages. Um, so we look at horse health, we look at horse behavior, and then we look at the forage too. How is the forage responding to the grazing um, to make sure that we're not overgrazing these forages? And then um, one last thing, Caitlin, the last slide here, I think if you just advance. 
I had a couple slides. Um, we talked about three-day eventing as an equestrian sport, a discipline last week with, with the attendees, um, with you all last week. So if you recall three-day eventing, um, it has a dressage phase, a cross-country jump phase, which is showed here. So outdoor large jumps, they, the horses are galloping. It's a much longer course. And then they finish the three-day event with a show jumping round. Um, so dressage, cross-country, and show jumping. Well, in between these three phases, there are veterinary in inspections. So the horses actually are evaluated by a vet. They're asked, to the, the handler, the rider is asked to jog the horse. And when they jog these horses, they are evaluating um, the horse and looking for soundness, or you know, they don't want the horses to be lame or having some difficulty as they move on through these three phases of competition in a three-day event. So Caitlin, if you can advance one more time for me real quick, and this will be the last thing. Um, this video shows, you guys can see the blue lines and these brightly colored dots on the anatomical features of the horse's body. So it's looking across joint angles, it's looking at the, the shape and, and putting these anatomical marks so that with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, so this program is also, it's actually called Deep Lab Cut. Some colleagues in the department, Dr. Samantha Brooks and her grad students are looking at a better, more objective tool to phenotype or characterize gait and movement of these, these sport horses during these events as maybe a, a, a more robust tool to look for subtle lamenesses or changes in gait. Um, so from a horse performance, a horse health aspect, it's kind of a, a neat, very applied methodology for, for you know, a more sustainable approach to these athletes. Um, so it, it really is another thing. It's not BMPs, but it's coming back into the sustainability of our industry from a horse health and welfare perspective. So that is all I have. Um, I think we have a, a couple minutes for questions here. I do see a question um, from Jan, is manure in pastures collected for removal and composting? Um, that's an excellent question. And so actually, yeah, a couple of the sites that Caitlin and I have worked with, they don't necessarily keep their horses in stalls. In fact, they only come into stalls very rarely. They're pretty much kept 24 seven out on their paddocks, but they do um, periodically almost every day or at least every other day, the, you know, the couple that owns the horses or the family that, that lives on the property, they go out and they just pick up the raw manure piles off the paddocks to keep the paddocks in good health and clean. And they, they're bringing that manure into these manure storage bins. They're adding sometimes, you know, leaf, like they're, when they rake leaves on their property, because that's just raw manure. So you do want to put some carbon material in there. So whenever they have spent hay, they've got leaf chaff, they're adding some of that in with the manure. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're just going out and, and picking up manure from the paddocks to help compost it and store it properly. Yeah, John. Okay. Um, I just have a question regarding... Uh, when you go up and down the highways between here and Ocala, you have a lot of eye candy with the pastures and the beautiful fences and everything. Do you, in your experiences, do you find that some people driving down here from the north get a, a view that they want to, uh, oh, that would be nice to own some horses and don't see the unglamorous side of maintenance until they get into it? Uh, I would think that would be a big threat. I don't care for the maintenance. I just love the shows and everything. What do you do with them? Um, I'll take that, Carissa. <laughs> so um, Caitlin and I, like Caitlin mentioned, we work with a lot of people that move into our counties and they think they want in to get into agriculture in general. Um, I think when we put the numbers to it and we look at five acres versus a large farm or ranch 500 or 100 acres um when you put the numbers to it horses are expensive um we didn't get into the expenses of them but looking at nutritional aspects you know they eat a lot um whether it's grazing um they're going to eat consume about 30 percent of their body weight and that a thousand pound horse like carissa had that's 30 pounds a day but these, um, a lot of people that get into this, sh think they can get into the showing or thoroughbred industry overnight. That's not going to happen. Um, it, it's, um, Caitlin has a lot of big ranches, big horse farms in her county. 
and um, very expensive. And I think that that showy look when you drive to Marion County is a part of that thoroughbred, um, what do I say, culture. Like when you drive through Kentucky and the rolling hills and you see all the farms and the pretty fences, um, it's a marketing tool too. I mean, they want to make their farm look good. Not everybody can do that because of the expense that's associated with that. So most of the people we deal with are those 10 acres or 15 acres or even five acres, and they just have a couple horses and it's mainly just for pleasure. Um, there may, they may be involved in some discipline, but um, much larger than that, you've got to have the land number one, which is expensive right now. Um, and the expenses that go along with nutrition and animal health um, and veterinary cost. Um, yeah. We, we, we um, go through all of that with our anybody new coming into any industry, um, ag related. So, yep, it's not cheap. Richard, did you still have a question? Yeah, um, I have a quite a bit of different question and it concerns municipalities that have horses in them um, and they're, you know, how do, how do they uh, form best practices because, and I'm thinking about New Orleans, which has all these buggies uh, with horse pool buggies and then even the romantic side of New York City in the evening is to take a buggy ride and they have um, also police forces that have horses. So I'm, I'm trying to see if the best practices uh, from an agricultural point of view would also apply to a much more urban area that has horses uh, for um, uh, tourist uh, uh, endeavors. Now, most of them I've seen uh, do seem to have some uh, way of a catchment system, but I don't know if they can adopt uh, uh, a best practices that have been devised from, from agricultural uh, departments. Can you address the municipal ownership? I'm talking, you know, cities, state, you know, like New York and and uh, New Orleans and so forth that have fairly large harsh populations in their city environment. Um, and I didn't know if your practices derived from agriculture are applicable to this other population that you did not cover. So what I would say, um is that you know the BMPs were developed in Florida, kind of for Florida, but there's other states that certainly have their own environmental challenges, and they definitely um, have or are working on adopting some sort of practices and figuring out amongst their state what kind of regulations are necessary. Can they keep it voluntary for the time being? So they're all kind of operating independently in that way. But I think as time goes on, I mean, especially in places like New York, um, California, Texas, Kentucky, um, you know, horse numbers are, are not slowing down. People are moving to these areas to participate in agriculture. So it's kind of more of a matter of time. Um, and for the municipal, like, you know, New Orleans, you mentioned, um, if, if Louisiana had, or if they do have a BMP type program, they might, I'm not sure. Um, you know, even if they're doing horse and buggy rides in the city, they, they have to be following those BMPs back on that farm where that horse lives. And that's more of the concern is where those horses are reared and the farms that they're raised on, um, not necessarily the work that they're doing in the city. So um, it really would come down to what each state is doing in the way of developing these um, environmental um, kind of practices to promote water quality. Um, and, and what we talked about is, is very specific to our state. Thank you very much. I, yeah, thank you, Richard. And thank you, Caitlin. I, if I may, I'm just going to add real quick. I mean, Richard, you had mentioned like catchment 
system. So, I mean, I know at least with the carriage horses, they had moved to requiring a lot of the municipalities require some kind of what we call like a bun bag or, or like, you know, like a diaper, not really a diaper per se, but something on the carriage or the device that will catch at least the manure. Um, and they also usually have like auxiliary crews that come up behind the carriages and, and do some of their, you know, on street manure management. I would assume then a lot of what we talked today about, um, thank you, Caitlin, Caitlin has to run. Um, I, I think what we talked about today in terms of manure management, there certainly would probably be some city ordinance or guidance at least, because a lot of the, like, when I think of Charleston, South Carolina, their carriage company, I mean, their their main building where they've, they've got the horses housed and their vehicles, that is pretty much downtown Charleston. And so if they're assembling or amassing any manure there, likely, you know, there's nowhere to spread it. They can't really compost maybe, but they're probably likely having it hauled away. So there still must be some practices in place where they're managing or doing something about that waste stream. At least there should be. Thank you. Okay, I think we need to say some words about next week uh, in conclusion here. I wanna thank you, Cynthia, Carissa, and Caitlin for another great class. Uh, we've gained so much insight from your vast knowledge and experiences in the equine industries of Alachua and Marion County. Now next week, we change gears a bit by hosting Dr. Regina Esterman, who's the owner and manager of the Hale Equestrian Center here in Gainesville. That's up in Hale Plantation, just off of uh, Tower Road. She and her husband also operate two additional horse farms in Alachua County that are home to around uh, 100 horses. She'll describe her early experience of showing horses in Ohio and uh, the academic preparation process that resulted in her becoming the owner and manager of an equestrian center and the challenges that accompany operating such exciting businesses locally. So hope you'll join us next week. Thank you for attending today. And again, thanks again, Carissa. Cynthia and Caitlin. Have a good Thank week. You. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bye. everyone.